Hello. One of the most visited sites in the city of Tiberias, on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, is a simple marble tomb. This is the final resting place of the medieval philosopher, theologian and lawyer Moses Maimonides. You get some idea of his importance to the history of Jewish scholarship from the Hebrew inscription, which reads, From Moses to Moses, there arose none like Moses. Today, Maimonides is widely regarded as one of the greatest scholars of the Middle Ages. He spent much of his life in Egypt and was influenced by a rich mix of Jewish, Islamic and ancient Greek thinkers. His authoritative magnum opus on Jewish law remains central to the subject more than eight centuries on. And his book, The Guide for the Perplexed, is one of the masterpieces of medieval philosophy. With me to discuss the life and work of Maimonides are John Haldane, Professor of Philosophy at the University of St Andrews, Sarah Strumser, Alice and Jack Ormond, Professor of Arabic Studies and currently Rector at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and Peter Adamson, Professor of Ancient and Medieval Philosophy at King's College, London. John Haldane, Maimonides was born in Cordoba in southern Spain around 1135. Could you tell us a bit about the environment? Mm. So this is in Andalusia, uh, Muslim Spain. Um, Cordoba is a, a cultured, affluent uh, city of merchants, learned people and so on. Uh, he came from a family that was, uh, we assume, a relatively affluent, professional family. Um, his father was both a rabbinical leader, a doctor and so on. And uh, he grew up, his, for his early years there, would have been ones of, of some leisure and some affluence, as I say. Um, but, uh, and also the, the surrounding culture was one of relevant, uh, relative tolerance, toleration. Um, but uh, by about the period of his ninth or tenth, I think he was nine at the time, there had arisen to the south in Morocco uh, a more uh, aggressive form of Islam. And uh, Andalusia is invaded... Uh, the city of Cordoba is itself uh, taken, and this uh, movement, this Almohad movement, uh, is really doesn't want to see um, either Jews or Christians uh, living freely under this. They have a slogan: uh, "No synagogue, no church." And so, this at that point, uh, he and his family are faced with a choice, a choice that actually others had uh, in other circumstances: whether to flee, <coughs> whether to suffer martyrdom, or whether to convert. And his family flee. Can I just pause for a moment? He came at the end of what I've always thought was a golden age yeah, of thought, yeah. where you have this, uh, maybe I'm romanticising it, but I went to, I go to Cordoba particularly to mm. feel this, that the, you had the Christianity, Islam and, the, and Judaism together in one small place, yes. each with their place of worship, and, and, and a sort of ease together, a sort of ease. Is that right? I think that is right, yes. I mean, the, the, in fact, we, we may come to this later on, I mean, the history of Jewish philosophy in its first phase is conducted essentially in Islamic lands and then later in Christian lands. And I think it would be fair to say that uh, Jews found it easier under Islam than they found it under Christianity. But uh, notwithstanding these tensions and so on, no, I think it is true. And in fact, it's interesting, in, in Florence there's a painting in one of the Dominican chapels that shows gathered together in this mural uh, Muslim, Jew and Christian uh, assembled in dialogue. His intellectual context was extremely precocious. He came from a family mm. of scholars. He was taught largely by his father, as we understand it. What would he speak? Uh, did he speak in the prevailing Arabic, or did spe was he bi-trilingual? What was going on? Uh, well, he certainly writes in what I think was referred to as Judeo-Arabic, and others may help Judeo-Arabic is... is, well, is go on. Uh, no, you tell me. Well, as I understand it, it's Arabic. I mean, this is in a written form. It's Arabic using uh, Hebrew letter uh, lettering. But he would have uh, grown up... Uh, uh, certainly with Arabic, I don't know to what extent, obviously, with regard to, say, uh, uh, the reading of Scripture and so on, uh, Hebrew would have been used as well. Though, as, uh, as I recall, only one of his works is actually written in Hebrew. I think the rest are all written in this Judeo-Arabic. But certainly he's growing up in a very cultured environment. As you say, his father's a doctor. He's studying science, which is, at that point is astronomy, optics, logic, some medicine. Later he's going to study medicine more. He's going to practice as a doctor and so on. But very alert. One thing, by the way, that's said of him, which is interesting, because when we get to the guide, it's said that the one thing he didn't like was poetry. 
Uh, and that may be interesting when we discuss this, his treatment of the language of Scripture later on. But clearly very learned, very cultured, and at ease with the surrounding Islamic environment. And like, uh, like his near contemporaries, Avicenna and Averroes, a wonderful range, physician, philosopher, oh, yes, yes, <laughs> linguist, yes. this, uh, this amazing range. Yes, and there's one anecdote just to throw in here. It's probably not true, but it's said that when he went into a period of exile after, the, uh, after Cordoba was taken, that he met Averroes, who I think would have been about ten years younger than him. I think that probably is apocryphal, but it makes the point that he was at ease with Islamic culture. Uh, Peter Adamson, after leaving, uh, well, feeling forced out, as they were, of Cordoba, um, m- moving around Spain, uh, going to Fez, and then very briefly to Palestine, they ended up in Cairo. What, what did they find, this family, in Cairo that meant that he stayed there and ended, stayed there for the rest of his life? Well, as John said, in general, the situation for Jews living in the Islamic world was one of toleration. So what happened to them in Spain with the Almohads was unusual, and they would have found a situation of toleration in Egypt as well. But if they were looking for a nice, boring, calm political situation, they didn't find it, at least not at first. Instead, um, what happened is that although when they arrived, Egypt was still under the domination of the Fatimid Caliphate, the Fatimids were actually on their last legs. So when a f- within a few years, you have a political shift in Egypt. Maimonides and his family actually moved to a city called Fustat, which is sort of a suburb of Cairo. And Cairo had been founded by the Fatimids back in the 10th century. The Fatimids are a Shiite caliphate, and they are one of the main powers in the region at this time. So you when they arrive, you've got the Fatimids in Egypt, you've got the Crusaders up in Palestine, and then you have a Sunni force who we call the Ayyubids. And what happens in the 1160s, when and this is the period where we are now, uh, is that the Fatimids basically invite the Ayyubids into Egypt to help them stave off an invasion from the Crusaders. And this leads to good news and bad news for the uh, Fatimids. The good news is that they managed to stave off the Crusaders, and the bad news is that the Ayyubids decide that they don't really want to leave. And the nephew of the invading general, uh, who dies shortly after this battle, is one Salah ad-Din, better known to us as Saladin. And Saladin first becomes the vizier of this nominal Fat- Fatimid caliphate, and then becomes the sultan of Egypt. That's terrific context. Let's get back to Maimonides. He got there. There's a sufficiently large Jewish community for him to be at ease there, as I understand it. And also, of course, he was perfectly at ease with the scholarship. This was, again, like Baghdad and Cordoba, uh, a city of great of great scholars and, and great scholarships. Um, can you just tell us more about the intellectual environment of Cairo, in which he found himself? It must have been congenial. He stayed there until the end of his life. He, his son then became chief rabbi after him, and his son became chief rabbi after him, and so on. They implanted themselves there very successfully. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think um, there's sort of several. There's two sides to this. So first, there's the, what the Fatimids had already done before he got there. I mean, the Fatimid Caliphate clearly is in decline in this period, but they had created a really impressive intellectual. Metropolis. They had founded Al Azhar Mosque and the connected Azhar University, and so there are a lot of books available. It's a very interesting place to be, just like Cordoba. Um, and again, there's no kind of problem being Jewish if you live there. There is, as you just said, there is a community of Jews living there. We're probably talking about thousands of Jews and not tens of thousands of Jews living in Cairo at the time. Um, but and there, so there is a community that Maimonides can join. But on the other hand, I think that it would be fair to say that when he arrives, he's already a big fish in a small pond in the sense that his command of the legal tradition and the Talmud, the Mishnah, these texts that we'll be getting on to talking about, is probably greater than that of, of any other scholar who's there at the time. So he, he's a big deal when he arrives, at least on the Jewish legal front, if not the philosophical front. But do we have, as we had in Cordoba and as we know about in Baghdad, do we have this swirl, sorry, this swirl of scholars, the Arabic scholars, the, the translations from Greek into Arabic being widely distributed, we, uh, new developments in philosophy Arabic, in, and sciences uh, and so on. Is that good? going on in Cairo? Yeah, I think to some extent. I mean, I, I think that for, I mean, certainly for Maimonides himself, the Jewish community would have been the most important thing. It's possible that he was influenced by some of the ideas that come through the Shiite uh, Fatimid tradition, this kind of Shiism called Ismailism, 
Um, but I think equally important, and this is actually something Sarah has stressed a lot in her in her work, is that being in Cairo puts Maimonides in the center of this sort of Mediterranean culture. And we know from epistles that still exist that he exchanged correspondence with people all over the Muslim world and beyond. So Baghdad, Yemen, also in southern France, um, all over Egypt, sometimes on legal issues, but also on a wide range of other issues, including philosophy. So being in Cairo really puts him, as it were, at, at a center, if not the center, of this kind of pan-Mediterranean intellectual culture. So there's rooms that not, after, not long after they arrived in Cairo, his brother, David, who's the keeper of the family treasure, was drowned at sea with the family treasure. What, what, what happened to Maimonides as a result of that? I think uh, in order to understand what happened to Maimonides with this tragedy, uh, one has to recapitulate a bit and to realize what it meant to him the f uh, when he came to Egypt uh, after the travel, after the family traveled from Cordova in Spain and in North Africa. Uh, although, as John had said, um, they uh, took the opportunity to flee when they could, uh, we actually don't know exactly what happened to the family during the years that they were in North Africa, but uh, I think our assumption must be that they outwardly behaved as Muslims, Inclu everyone, all the Jewish community, including my mom's family. And when they managed to flee, I think uh, we have to assume a traumatic experience in the, be in the background. And the first few years in Egypt allowed Maimonides a some years of peace and quiet to establish himself, as Peter said, in the community, in the Jewish community, and to write. And suddenly, uh, with the disappearance of his brother, he had uh, debts that he had to cover. He had his uh, uh, brother's widow and uh, small child to support, and he had to find a way to support himself. And this is when he moves uh, into court to uh, work as the uh, court physician, as one of the court's physician. And this is also... At the court of Saladin. At the court of Saladin. For a man who's written about law and philosophy, suddenly to become the court physician of Saladin is quite a jump. <laughs> but never mind. Let's just leave that as another exceptional thing about him. Sorry, can you so, continue? So uh, I, think, I think this is when he actually uh, began to move, to move out of the uh, precincts of the Jewish community and to begin to move... Uh, inside the wider uh, Egyptian uh, society, this is where uh, where he probably got into theological debates and uh, conversations with Muslims. Um, I think this is where he moves more into the public eye. So you, your, your, uh, your interpretation is that these these moves around, these forced moves around, actually uh, enriched his appreciation of the general Mediterranean culture and enabled him to do the great things he went on to do? I, I think so. Maimonides uh, is a complicated person and um, there are, he tells us that when his brother drowned he experienced a year of uh, real depression. But he comes out of these traumatic experiences, uh, as you say, enriched and able to cope with... Uh, the more uh, nuanced uh, experience of human life, and this finds its way into his writings. How do we know so much about Maimonides' character uh, compared with many of his contemporaries? Well, we, uh, the short answer is that we are lucky. Uh, <laughs> Maimonides uh, lived most of his adult life and uh, in Egypt, and in Egypt we have we are fortunate to have uh, the, a thing that, which is the closest we get to having an archive of documents in, from this period. Jews at this, uh, in, in all synagogues, Jews do not discard documents on which they expect to have written the name of God, the Tetragrammaton. And uh, therefore they collect all uh, papers uh, written in Hebrew and put them aside for decent burial. In Cairo, because of the climate and because of the uh, continuity of the community, we uh, have a collection, a treasure trove of documents 
uh, called the Geniza, which was found in the synagogue in the 19th century and which contains uh, Maimonides' correspondence, uh, Maimonides' deeds, his writings, everything uh, about him. And this gives us a, a wonderful opportunity to see his life and to see also his emotions including an extraordinary account of just one day in his life, which is, it makes you exhausted just to read it. <laughs> what he does at the court of Saladin, then back to holding his own court at his own house and writing. John Holden, you wanted to make a remark there. I've got a question to ask you. But of course, yes. Do no, I was just going to say, I mean, it's interesting what's been said. This uh, He becomes effectively a, a rabbinical leader of, of Egyptian Jewry, and as has been said, he's writing to people uh, elsewhere. And his reputation for... Uh, brilliance, obviously, but practical wisdom, if you like. I mean, he's this business about conversion is very interesting, what's sometimes referred to as pseudo-conversion, so adopting the modes and the dress and so on. And he, he says in a letter of consolation, there's a debate about this, whether it's a proper thing to do, and he says, no, it is better that than martyrdom, though better still to for the purity of the law to, to, to go into exile, to flee and so on. But what is interesting is that he sees... Interesting, I think, telling us about the man, and it's going to lead to his philosophical ideas, that he sees the purity of Jewish observance as residing in, as it were, the condition of the interior soul. And so the question about adopting the modes and so on, he doesn't see that as a risking apostate, you know, of abandonment and so on, though he's actually accused of this, and particularly with regard to some of his teachings on resurrection and so on, he becomes suspect, and we can discuss that in due course. But I'd what like emerges is this purity of, of intellect, I think. I'd like to ta try to t tackle his works now, which are... Well, here we go. Let's start. His first important was commentary on the Mishnah. John, could you uh, briefly, I'm afraid, explain <laughs> what he did there and why it's so important? Well, again, I shall uh, need help from my colleagues, possibly. But uh, I think no, what, we need to, what we need to do to, to, to understand this is understand Torah. So the, the, the Torah as uh, understood in a narrow sense and then in a broad sense. So in the narrow sense, it's the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, which are by tradition attributed to Moses. So we've got Torah in that restricted sense. Then we've got Torah in the broader sense, which is the entire Hebrew Bible, what for Christians gets called the Old Testament, uh, plus Talmud, which is the oral tradition, codified, written down, and so on, plus commentary. So what he does is, and this is in his role as a sort of legal scholar, a juridical thinker, and so on, he works on the oral, uh, on the oral commentary, uh, at one point producing an edition, as it were, of this, but then also producing commentary on this. And this is a very rich source both of rabbinical teaching and guidance, commentary and so on, but it also is going to lead into some of the philosophical ideas that will become the subject and treatment of the guide, which is the work we're going to come to later on. Peter Adamson, just get finally to, to, to uh, get slightly more about him, what can you give us some outline of the number of intellectual influences on him? He was very, uh, f very uh, beholden to and very fond of Aristotle, for instance. Can we go from there? Who is he taking in? Right. So Aristotle, of course, would have been known to him thanks to these Greek-Arabic translations that you mentioned earlier that were done in the ninth century. And although there's some controversy about how much Maimonides knew about Aristotle, certainly he knew some Aristotle, and he was also deeply influenced by a certain philosophers writing in Arabic who were themselves influenced by Aristotle. And the main figures here would be Al-Farabi, a 10th century Platonist and Aristotelian Avicenna, who you mentioned earlier, and his contemporary Averroes. He actually commends to one of his students the study of both Al-Farabi, whose works he says are fine flower, and Averroes, who he sees, like many other medieval thinkers, as the most reliable commentator and guide to Aristotle. So there's certainly this strong influence from the Aristotelian tradition on Maimonides, almost goes without saying that there's a strong influence on him from the rabbinical tradition that John has been talking about. And beyond that, I think that we can say very interestingly that this giant of Jewish philosophy and legal scholarship is also influenced in various ways by Islamic theology. So he, first of all, talks pretty extensively about the schools of speculative theology in Islam, which are known as kalam, which means word, or ilm al-kalam, the science of the word. He's actually very critical of them. He doesn't like the fact that they present this world which is not amenable to rational analysis because God can effectively do whatever he wants. So 
God could turn you into a frog and then turn you back again. There's nothing impossible about that. And like Averroes, Maimonides thinks that that's a very unsettling kind of doctrine because it limits our ability to find the world intelligible and to explain it using philosophy. Is there any direct Christian influence? Was he influenced by the writing of St. Augustine, for instance? No. Uh, I think the only Christians really in the intellectual background for him are the ones who helped translate these works from Greek into Arabic. Most of them were actually Christians. Mm -hmm. And Al-Farabi is an interesting case here. He was a Muslim, but most of his collaborators in Baghdad in the 10th century were Christians. So you have, I mean, really, if you think about what you might call Arabic philosophy, what that is is uh, philosophers writing in Arabic of all three faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And there's actually a case where one of Farabi's students had a philosophical correspondence with a Jewish philosopher in the 10th century. So that just goes to show you how ecumenical the enterprise was. Senator Shrumza, he followed his commentary on the Mishnah with the Mishneh Torah, which I, I'm told, which you have said in your notes, is extremely important. Can you introduce us to that? Well, I think first uh, we, we should say another word about uh, the language scene of Maimonides. He, he, he speaks in Arabic he, he writes in Arab, in Judeo-Arabic. Uh, he is fluent in Hebrew, but uh, his cultural language in many ways is Arabic. And the Aristotelian philosophical tradition that he gets, he gets through the Spanish tradition. So although he reads uh, Themistius and Alexander of Aphrodisias and Aristotle, he reads it all as it comes through the prism of the uh, Andalusian uh, Aristotelian tradition. The rabbinic uh, culture that he gets also gets, in some ways, through uh, the prism of what happens in the Islamic world regarding Islamic law. And uh, we can see already from his attempt to, co to write the commentary on the Mishnah that he already had his life work uh, planned for him. The commentary on the Mishnah was a preparation for distilling all the oral law as it is found in the Mishnah in the Talmud and uh, putting it together into one uh, code which is the Mishnah Torah literally is the second law or the second to the written law and as he himself tells us in the introduction to Mishnah Torah his intention was to write a concise code not really a vadim mekum but something that would be concise enough which will put together all the traditions, cut through all the accumulated uh, debates and, and disagreements and diversity of opinions, and present in Hebrew, in Mishnaic Hebrew, uh, the end result, what is the law regarding every single, uh, every, every single matter. Can you just be specific once or twice for our listeners as, as to what he's distilling? And I mean, it's an, a massive project. There's, it's an extraordinary thing to do. And given what he did uh, in order to live a life as chief rabbi and at the court of, of, uh, uh, of Saladin, goodness knows where he found all that time to do all that work. But still, he did. That's that's not he did. So just give us some examples. When you say all the laws, you talk about the laws of eating and the laws about burial. Is that what we're talking about? If we are talking about uh, things from the prayer, first prayer that you say in the morning to the prayer that you say over the dead and to the laws of what will happen uh, when the third temple is built and laws of sacrifices which were as relevant then as they are today, which means completely irrelevant. Uh, the book was meant to present everything that either the law, the written law, the Torah, or the oral law ever discussed, and to present the legal uh, decision about it. Now, uh, in Jewish tradition, as in Islamic tradition, uh, before getting to uh, the actual decision, legal decision, uh, rabbis would first of all go through all the accumulated literature, starting from the Bible, going through the commentaries, the Mishnah, the Talmud, present various opinions, and then perhaps come to a decision. Whereas Maimonides says this is a waste of time. You can learn it, you can learn it in order to sharpen your brain, but this is not what you were made to be. As a person, as a Jew, you were made to 
get to behave correctly, which is what the law is for, and then to think and to sharpen your brain in order to get to intellectual achievements. John Allen. Well, I, I'm, it's right to press a matter of detail, but it's also, I think, useful if we sort of draw back and try and get a broader picture of the ideas here. I think, really, in a way, he's looking in two directions, one to Judaism and the other one to philosophy. With regard to Judaism, what I think he, he takes, as other Jews did, is the idea that these, this people is the unique possessor of a revelation from God and that what that gives them in Torah is a sacred history and account of origination and development and so on, uh, law and a covenant, that they are covenant of God, they stand in a special relationship to God. Now, all of that he's very respectful of. With regard to Jewish, quote, philosophical thought, you mentioned Kalam earlier on, I think with regard to Kalam, he's not that uh, impressed at all by it. And for the reason given that if on the Kalam view, for example, God could recreate the world from one moment to the next. So there's no intelligibility in the world itself. Reason cannot understand the world. It's just a flux and so on. I mean, if there is order, it's just because God has chosen for the time being to continue as at present. But what he's looking for is a way of understanding reality, not just the question of what has been given in Revelation, but in the broader sense. And there he's looking to these two sources, uh, well, Greek philosophy in one way or another. You asked earlier on about was he influenced by Christian writing. No, but some of the great Christian writers, such as Augustine and he, are commonly influenced by this Neoplatonic tradition, which is a very strong intellectual tradition. So there's Neoplatonism on the one hand, Aristotelianism on the other hand. Aristotelianism is very naturalistic. Neoplatonism is very speculative and has a rather complex theory of the emanations in one thing and another. But these two influences are very strong upon him. And his attitude, I think, to Judaism is more with regard to questions like law, revelation, preserving the sense of covenant and so on. Peter, Peter Adamson, you wanted to come in, and can I press you just to talk a bit more about how his, Maimonides' personal philosophy is emerging? Yeah, well, in a way, that's what I wanted to say anyway, because uh, I think this issue about philosophy and the law is, is really embodied in what we find when we open the Mishneh Torah, which is this section called the Book of Knowledge, which he presents as a kind of set of foundations of the law, and rather surprisingly, perhaps, a lot of this consists of a kind of resume of Aristotelian philosophy. So he goes through Aristotle's cosmology, he goes through Aristotle's theory of the four elements, he goes through Aristotle's ethics, and he presents, for example, the virtues as the golden mean, right? So courage is the mean between cowardice and recklessness. He doesn't slavishly follow Aristotle by any means. So, for example... He says that on some points you want to adopt the extreme rather than the mean. Mm -hmm. So a good Jew should always be meek, for example, and you should be not, you know, just the right amount meek, but as meek as possible. So he's not a thoroughgoing Aristotelian, but I think it's really significant that he sees Aristotelian philosophy really as a kind of basis for which you could study Jewish law. And he really thinks, as Sarah said, he really thinks of Jewish law the so-called halakot, the ritual um, injunctions, as a way of preparing yourself for this higher intellectual study. I think uh, we should um, distinguish two uh, tracks that Maimonides tries to uh, to present. One is for uh, the the nation. How, the, how do you build a, a righteous nation? And for that, the Mishnah Torah uh, presents the code. How do you present uh, build a, a, a society of people who would be uh, righteous and lead in the right direction. But there is also the way that the individual can take. And for the individuals, there might be other ways. Uh, we we can see that he had two ideals for two models for human perfection. One was obviously Moses. Uh, who had it all, who had revelation, and who had knowledge, and who understood as much as a person can understand. And the other um, model for human perfection was Aristotle. So it was clear that for Maimonides, as an individual, you could reach uh, the ideal even if you didn't go through the Mishneh Torah and all the uh, halachot. But for that, you had to be an exceptional individual, whereas... Uh, if you think of a group of people that would prepare as many in such individuals as possible, he thought of the Jewish law as the perfect setting for that. 
John Haldane, we, let's turn to what sort of is his masterpiece, The Guide for the Perplexed, which he began in 1176. Obviously, we'd all like to know what he means by perplexed, but I'd like to just go into what he thinks about what were then great issues, God, uh, the soul, uh, whether there is a future life and so on. Can you just give us a taste or something, anyway, what do you want to say about well, it, what he thought about mm, those things? Sure. I mean, it's, it's a very complex work, um, and uh, it's made up of various elements, and we'll say one thing, a couple of things about those in a second. Actually, in answer to the question, who is the perplexed, that's a relatively easy... I, I'm going to say this. That's a relatively <laughs> easy question to answer. What it's not for, it's not for the simple person who's simply observing the law in their conduct and straightforward and so on, who's untroubled, as it were, and nor is it for the philosopher who's thought matters through in their own way and one thing or another. The perplexed is much more like somebody in the present day who's a kind of well-educated person but who feels a tension between as well what they're learning from science, what they're learning from philosophy and so on, and say script what they're hearing in a church or in a synagogue or in a mosque. So they're perplexed. How can you reconcile the learning of the day with the religious uh, teachings of the day. That's who the perplexed person is. It's not the simple believer. It's not the sophisticated philosopher. It's the, the honest doubter. It's the edu exactly. It's the educated person who's struggling to try to reconcile, as in the present day, for example, for many Christians, what science or philosophy is teaching on the one hand and what they're reading in scripture or hearing in homilies in churches on the other. That's the perplexed person. And what he's trying to do is provide a reconciliation. Now, the question is... In which direction is that going to go? Effectively, and this is going to get him into some trouble with some people, he's going to treat a lot of scripture as allegorical. He's going to say, look, you have to understand that this was produced for people at a certain stage in development and so on. The first thing that Moses had to do was get the people to believe in a single God. That's the first thing. And, of course, the imagery of that is talks to God as if God were a lordly master somewhere or other, you know, in another place. That's a stage you go through, but what you're proceeding to is the more philosophical understanding. We'll hear more about that. But God is beyond any category of language. God is beyond any sense of a thing or a non-thing and so on. God isn't a being in that sense. God is being. This is very abstract. But what he's trying to reconcile that with is the ordinary understanding of Scripture by saying this, this is a series of metaphors, analogies, allegories, but what you have to look for is the inner truth, as it were, the secret teaching, the esoteric teaching, which is going to be in line with the kind of philosophy I'm going to set out for you. But as, as I understand it, Sir Roma, he's also saying, like, taking the Arist Aristotelian strain, that by studying nature, it's one way to approach the divine. And there's also the question of God can best be divine by negatives, what he is not. But let's, uh, the study of nature, can we bring that into play? Um, my wanted is, um assumption was that you cannot be a true believer if you are an ignoramus. And in order to not to be an ignoramus, you have to understand things as... You, un you have to understand the reality as it is, which means that you have to know logic in order to think correctly, and you have to study the reality, as John said before, you have to study the reality and and take it for what it is, and not to force reality, uh, tr the truth on the rea uh, on the reality. The the truth should be what is reflected in reality. And I think one of the things that is uh, important to see in the guide is that it is not just um, a reconciliation of the law of Moses with philosophy. It's a reconciliation of the law of Abraham mm. with. Uh, <coughs> with uh, philosophy. Uh, the, the motto of the guide uh, goes back to a saying of, of uh, Abraham, uh, who calls the name, the, uh, the name of the Lord as the Lord of the universe. And what Maimonides tries to show that if you study the reality of the world, you'll uh, get away from pagan uh, superstitious beliefs, the ones that were around Abraham when Abraham began to study the world, and you will get to understand that there is a single God which you cannot really uh, perceive. You can only get closer to him by understanding what he is not. Peter Adamson, can you tell us uh, briefly, I'm afraid, what, what is meant by negative theology, to follow on from what Sarah has been saying? Well, negative theology is basically just the view that you can't say anything about God and perhaps you can't think anything about God either. And this is a long tradition which runs back 
to the Greeks, to the Neoplatonists, who have already been mentioned. It's also something you find the Almohads saying, and this is a quite interesting possibility that Maimonides, despite his traumatic experiences with the Almohads, may have been in agreement with them about this point and maybe even influenced. But Maimonides does take this in a new direction. First of all, he takes an unusually rigorous line, so he really thinks you can't say anything true about God. You cannot say anything positively about God and have it come out true. That would be misleading. The reason it would be misleading is that it would put God on a par with us or other created things. So, for example, uh, Sarah and John know a lot about Maimonides, so they're knowing, right? But you cannot say that God is knowing because then you'd be putting God on a par with John and Sarah, right? You're not allowed to do that. What he says, therefore, is that you should interpret everything it says in Scripture about God in one of three ways, either just allegorically or symbolically, as a concealed negation. So if it says that God is knowing, you take that to mean that he is not ignorant. In other words, he doesn't lack knowledge that we might have. Or you take it as to be what he calls an attribute of action. And what that means uh, is something is an attribute of action if it refers to things that God does in the world. And although it might sound like you're then saying something about God, right? God is providential. That means that he ordered the world well. That sounds like you're talking about God, but actually you're not really, because what you're doing is talking about the world. You're saying the world is providentially ordered. It's well designed. It's actually a statement about the world. That's why it's true. It's not a statement about God. John Holden, can you tell us what for you is the um, philosophical or thought most cru- crucial philosophical centre of the guide to the perplexed? Uh, guide for the perplexed. Yes, um, I, I think it is this way of elaborating uh, a philosophical theology, if you like. Um, one thing I would just emphasise, because I think in the Christian world people really lose sight of this. What Judaism was is attached to all the way through and remains attached to, and what from the point of view of Judaism makes Christianity in some respects abhorrent, is monotheism. It is that the whole Tr- the whole richness of the Jewish people is that they passed from the phase of polytheism of the people who surrounded them to belief in a single deity and an all, all powerful and transcendent deity. And we say Christianity, for example, it introduces Trinity, it looks like it's breaking up the unity of God. So, what Moses Maimonides does is, is doing all the time is emphasizing the transcendence of God as the ground of being, the ground of knowledge. God's knowledge is the same as reality. And here's the thought. What we are to do, how we are to perfect ourselves, we are made images of God, we have intellect, we have will, we are to engage in this imitatio dei, this imitation of the divine, by becoming, to the extent that we can, God-like, by transforming the world that God has expressed out of his nature back into mind through our knowledge of it. So well, the world is a creation out of mind and it's a reception into mind. And I think that's a fantastic and enduring contribution. I mean, it's not unique to, to, to him. He's drawing in part on Aristotle there. But I think that idea that we come to perfection in understanding the reality that surrounds us is a very powerful and enduring idea, though it leaves a question of what is to be said of the humble who are incapable of that. And that is a problem, I think. Sarah, <coughs> Sarah from the, is there a sense in which the mind is the soul? In Maimonides, only when he speaks to uh, to the multitudes, when he speaks to the initiate, he always distinguishes between the soul and the upper part of the soul, which is the intellect. And for him, the um, the whole purpose of uh, human existence is the. Uh, perfection of the intellect, not just the soul. The soul is a complicated uh, entity. It has baser parts, and these are the parts that we have to feed and that we have to take care of, but these are not the parts that uh, uh, of which we, sh- we as human beings should be uh, proud. The parts that make are the part of the soul that makes us really uh, what we are, humans, is the intellect. Peter Adamson, how widely was he read in his time, briefly, and what about f- future generations? How how did his work percolate through the centuries? Well, I mean, the guide was written fairly late in his work, uh, late in his uh, life, rather. And um, so I think during his own life, probably his rabbinical works are the most widely read. But it becomes very widely read very quickly, um, late in his life. And at the time of his death, in the same year of his death, it was translated into Hebrew by Samuel Ibn Tibon in southern France. And that 
puts it in front of a wider readership and it becomes controversial very quickly. I, I think if, if you think about what Maimonides is doing in the guide, he's always treading this line between saying what reason can do and what it can't do. So can we can we figure out whether the world is eternal? I know, I've got to move to his influence now. Right. And, so, and so what happens is that some people say, okay, we like the rationalist aspect of Maimonides, but we want to take it even further. And other people say that we think Maimonides has gone too far. And in fact, his works were burned in France in the 1230s because um, rabbis asked the Dominicans to burn them because they thought he was being too radical, too Aristotelian, as it were. John, John could you take on how, who he influenced and how? Yeah, the next, yeah. uh, uh, it was also translated into Latin. I can't remember exactly when that is, but not right around that time. Um, he, uh, uh, he does have an influence on Christian writers. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, you could think of Aquinas standing to Christianity as Maimonides stands to Judaism, I think. Um, and I mean, as this giant figure who is producing this somatic integration of every aspect and so on, uh, Aquinas refers to him, Rabbi Moses. Uh, he, he refers to him in relation to the question of the eternity of the world and creation and so on. He also refers and indeed defers to some extent to him over this question of negative theology. So he does enter into the the broader uh, bloodstream. And it has to be said at this point, medieval philosophy within the Islamic and Jewish worlds, this is a big issue, are beginning to come to an end. And the, as it were, the baton that is handed on into the Christian world. So his legacy, in an odd sort of way, is going to be its influence on some of the ideas of some Christian thinkers. Until um, his recovery, but later on by Jews. Sorry. Sarah, how, do, how does he stand in contemporary Jewish thought? Well, he achieved, when he called his book the second to the law, uh, he wanted to canonize his book, and I think he achieved that. He became uh, part of the canon in, in the sense that you cannot discard it. You can interpret it away, but you cannot discard it. So people read the Mishneh Torah, people read, read it as if it's really the second to the law. Um, People, as you mentioned in the beginning of your work, come up to Tiberias. I think if he is buried there, he would turn in his grave. <laughs> but he, uh, people uh, think of him as the topmost uh, Jewish thinker. Well, thank you very much indeed, Sarah. From Sir John Haldane, Peter Adamson.